if there is one thing that the charismatic experience gives you, is it's the knowledge that we have something now that we've been missing for so many years before that experience. That we have a full inheritance made available to us and that it is God's will and desire that we appropriate it. Nothing displeases him more than to send Christ to the cross to give you something and then for you to say, well, that's not for today. Or there may be exceptions to his promises. Or I don't think it'll work for me. There's nothing that would displease God more than to punish his son to give you something. To put, his, to put your diseases, for example, on him and then for you to fail to appropriate that. Right. Yeah. And so the book of Hebrews, as we stressed last time, is, is showing us, for example, in chapter 8, verses 5 and 6, that we have a better covenant based on better promises. And I want to encourage your heart uh, with that again this morning. Verse 6 of chapter 8, For now Christ has obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which is established on better promises. Over and over in the book of Hebrews, that's the key word. You watch for it. The word better, how we've got it better as Christians. The church today is still living in the shadows. And Hebrews 10.1 says the Old Testament revelation was but a shadow of better things to come. And how that under the shadow they had healing and health promised and protection and deliverance and <clears throat> prosperity. And my land, dear friends, if that was the shadow, we ought at least to claim that much. <laughs> and so <clears throat> I showed you last time how that we have a better covenant based on better promises. We've got a better ministry than the angels can give because... We have Christ himself who has entered into the presence of God, whoever lives to make intercession for us, who ministers to us. We also have angelic ministry, but we've got it even better than the Old Testament saints. That's all they had. And we've got a better leader than Moses. Chapter 3 tells you that. Chapter 2 told you had a better ministry than the angels. Chapter 3, a better leader than Moses. We've got Christ himself. We've got a better high priest than Aaron. Jesus himself, the high priest. We've got a better sacrifice. We've got better promises. We've got a better sanctuary. Well, we've got better everything. And uh, some of us, I don't think, have really, has really uh, appreciated that. Chapter 2 of the book of Hebrews. Coming out of the shadows into the light. This morning I want to deal with our full redemption. Last time we saw we had a better covenant based on better promises. Now a full redemption. And what that includes is set forth here as deliverance basically from death itself. There's nothing that he could give us that would be a greater treasure than deliverance from death. And what he means and what the Bible means and what I mean this morning is not what you're already thinking by being delivered from death. Uh, there, there is something far greater than most of us have ever been told or taught that's available to overcomers. A full redemption which can be realized right now. Now I know that, well, I'll be conservative. About half of you probably can't handle that. But if you'll wait until you hear all the message, then I'm going to show you it's based right on what you were taught in Sunday school. It was just never put together. That we, we can have, there's a group of saints at the end of time, the end of the age, and that's when we're living, who will participate in a full redemption. Amen. There's, never been a, there's never been a group of saints yet that have realized their full inheritance in Christ. Because you have health and prosperity and healing and all of that, that's a part of your redemption, but there's a full redemption that's stressed here. And I hope you can see it this morning. God grants you a spirit to hear and not to reason. Therefore, for chapter 2, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we've heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. You've been hearing it here for a long time. <laughs> Don't let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, 
How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. So he's <clears throat> stressing here, as we showed last Sunday morning in our, in our worship and study period, that Christ ministers a better redemption, a better covenant than even the angels could minister. What he's saying here, and some of you may not know that, that the Old Testament law, the Old Testament covenant, when it was revealed to Moses, came through the ministry of angels. Angels revealed to him there on Mount Sinai, the law and all of this. And uh, this is set forth in Scripture. It's set forth here again, right here. And if that revelation, Paul says here, uh, uh, well, ministered by angels, if any disobedience to that revelation brought its own just recompense of reward, meaning punishment, then how much more? Or how much less can we escape if we neglect to hear the full revelation, full redemption, healing of the body as well as the soul, for example? Uh, how shall we escape if we neglect so full a salvation? God confirming it, verse 4, to you so that you can believe it with signs and miracles and wonders and gifts of the Holy Spirit. And he's still doing that today. I'll tell you, dear friends, the church, the institutional church of our day is not going to escape judgment. They're going to go through tribulation, great tribulation, which is about to come upon the earth because they are neglecting this revelation through the Son of God, which he's confirming by his Holy Spirit today. Amen. Praise the Lord. Anyone out there today? <clears throat> It is true. We, we can't, uh, he's, Christ is not just, uh, just a big brother, you know, as sometimes I hear him spoken of. As we'll see in a moment, he is pleased to call us brethren, but we shouldn't treat him just like he's a big brother and pick and choose what we want to obey. We don't dare neglect all he said in his word. As God gives you light, you better obey it. All right, verse 5, For unto the angels hath he not not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. No, he didn't do that. He put the world in subjection of man. For in a certain place he testified, saying, What is man, that thou art mindful of him? Psalm 8. Or the son of man, that thou visitest him? Thou, made him a little, thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownedest him with glory and honor, and didst set, set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. Adam had all things put under him. Of course, he forfeited that when he fell into sin. And uh, what he's saying here is that God did not subject this world to angels, but he subjected it to man, who is made just a little lower than the angels in power and uh, intelligence and life and that sort of thing. We are just below the angels in that respect. He's leading up to say that Christ was pleased then not to take on the nature of angels, but to take on our nature a little lower than the angels so that he could redeem us, give us a perfect redemption, identify with us in suffering and death, overcome both suffering and death for us. And so verse 9, we see Jesus that was made a little lower than the angels for the purpose of suffering death, you see. Crowned now with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. He's already taken your death upon him. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So even Christ came into perfection. That is, uh, perfection as far as obedience is concerned, through suffering. For both he that sanctifieth and they that are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he's not ashamed to call us brethren. We're all one with him. Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren, this is Christ speaking, 
I will declare <clears throat> thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church, will I sing praise unto thee. And again I will put my trust in him, and again behold I and the children which God hath given me. For as much then as children, now look at verses 14 and following, for as much then as children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. <laughs> for verily he took not on him the nature of angels but he took upon him the seed of Abraham wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto us his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted he is able to succor them that are tempted and so Christ chose to take upon himself our nature. An angel could not redeem man. God as spirit could not redeem man. He had to take upon himself our nature so that through <clears throat> the suffering and death of a sinless person on the cross then he could stand first as our redeemer. God could accept him in our place. But even, even in addition to that, that as God, now you'll have to understand this, dear friends, what we are saying when we make this statement, God could not enter in to your suffering and understand it unless he took upon your nature, himself your nature. It's impossible for God to have pain or suffer or worry or anything else. And he had to take on our nature and overcome all of that, you see, in his flesh, a real temptation. A real human, a real humanity, as well as deity, but a real humanity. So that he could, he says, be a faithful high priest, and that when we are tempted, since he was tempted in every way that we are, that he could comfort us when we're tempted. He ever liveth to make intercession for us, Hebrews 7.25. And it's, uh, it's not a light thing to consider that Jesus Christ, I don't care what your temptation is, what your trial is, has promised you and tells you here and tells you again in the fourth chapter that he knows what you're going through. Exactly. And that because he still is human, glorified to be sure, he can feel with you what you're feeling and thus comfort you. And he says, I'll never leave you, never forsake you, and to cast all your cares on me because I care for you. Hallelujah. We've got a faithful high priest that when we're tempted he can... Succor us, can comfort us. But I want to <clears throat> stress this morning what's contained in verses 9 and 14 and 15. The full redemption that he has given us goes all the way and redeems us not just from the curse of the law and adversity and poverty and need and sickness, but death itself. For we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the purpose of suffering death crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every one of us. Now, if he's died, if he's tasted your death, which simply means he has died for you, then you don't have to die. And 14 and 15, for as much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself like, likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him who has the power of death. God is not the author of death. Satan is the author of death. God doesn't kill any man. He may permit it or allow it in judgment and even chastisement. The Bible says that. But the death angel who went through Egypt, Psalm 78, we're told God sent evil angels into Egypt and took the firstborn because the devil is the author of death. And he has overcome him, verse 14, and he has delivered them, you're going to include yourself, he has delivered them who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to this bondage. Amen. Right. Bondage of what? Bondage of death. Right. Now, I'm going to encourage you this morning to listen with your heart, not your intellect, because uh, sometimes 
What we're saying isn't what it's going to sound like that we're saying to you if you're listening with your intellect. And you're going to have to hear the whole message. I hope you can rest through it. Because he has given us a full redemption. Amen. And every Christian here today, up to a point, believes that. At least they will believe theoretically in the doctrine or truth that Christ's death at Calvary has redeemed us from death. The only question remain, uh, remains is, when do we enter into our full redemption? Now, <clears throat> the institutional church obviously says that full redemption is not for now. The only thing that we've been redeemed from, or the only redemption we have now, is the redemption of our souls. We're saved. We enter into things like freedom from sickness and want and need and, well, you name it, and even death itself out there. Uh, in the future somewhere over on the other side. <clears throat> That's the institutional church. It's no news to anyone for me to tell you that. They don't believe in a full redemption. That is uh, the availability of it in this life. Charismatics, for all practical purposes, are about the same place. They don't really believe in a full redemption. They go a little beyond the idea of just the redemption of the soul and say, well, we can enter into some of our inheritance now, like you know, healing when you're sick, and if you're starving to death, God will give you a loaf of bread. But I find very few charismatics as I go about this country who uh, know that there's a full redemption in body, mind, soul, and spirit, and that Jesus Christ promises us redemption from poverty and sickness. Like Third John 2, for example, Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. Now, not many charismatic have charismatics have appropriated that truth. In fact, you're going to even get some of them mad by preaching that. Uh, a full redemption from poverty and sickness. <clears throat> but I want to submit to you this morning that Paul, who wrote Hebrews, and I won't try to prove that, some people question it because he didn't stick his name on the front of it. But Paul, who wrote Hebrews, also said in the 8th chapter of Romans, which I wish you would turn to, Paul also saw the manifestation of a full redemption before the full consummation of this age. He saw... And he states it as clearly as words can say it in Romans 8, that there will be a group of saints at the end of the age that will participate in full redemption. Amen. Now I'm going to say it, who will not taste death. Hallelujah. Now I did not say that maybe most of you won't die. That's up to you and your confession on the basis of the Word of God. I'm just saying what the Scripture is saying this morning, so stay with it till we get done. I didn't say we would live eternally in this physical body. I didn't say that at all. But I'm going to show you this morning that what you've been taught for years in Sunday school, God is now putting it all together and trying to get a group of people ready who will rise up in faith and believe it and appropriate it. Now look at what he says in Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> Uh, let's begin at verse 15. For you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. It shall be revealed in us. Where? That's the only question. When? That's the only question. There's where there's no agreement. When is it going to happen? For the earnest expectation of the creation. Now this is, if you have King James, it says the creature. That isn't a proper translation. Paul said Creation. Wherever you see creature here, it means the whole creation. For the earnest expectation of the creation waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creation was made subject to vanity, that is, it participated in the fall into sin, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. 
For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now, and not only they, but ourselves also, which are the first fruits of the Spirit, those who have the baptism are the first fruits, first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, what adoption? The redemption of our body. I submit to you, dear friends, he doesn't say resurrection of the body. Redemption includes resurrection. It's just a bigger term. He said that the whole creation is groaning and travailing in pain together till now, until now, waiting for the manifestation of the matured sons of God. And when they are manifested in a full redemption, then creation itself is going to participate in the redemption. Now the scriptures show that there's going to be a group of saints who are going to rise up in faith and claim their full redemption and walk in their full redemption and not have to taste of death. Now, as I've said uh, already, I'm not talking about the fact that the Bible doesn't say, for example, uh, that uh, most men will not die or all men don't have to die. The Bible, on the contrary, does say that it's given unto men once to die and after that the judgment. We're not talking about uh, what's happened up until this end time. We're not talking about what may happen to most saints with respect to death. Uh, and uh, what Paul is talking about here in Hebrews and Romans 8 and other passages. We're talking about what I am going to set forth for your consideration this morning. There's a full redemption you can participate in according to your faith that is set forth for the saints, a group of saints at the end of the age. Now, listen a little bit to the logic of Scripture. The Scriptures say the Christian has been delivered from death. Christ has tasted death for all men. He has overcome him who has the power of death. All Christians, every one of you out there, believe that death's been abolished for you, and every one of you, almost at least without exception, believe, if so, fact so, you're going to die. So that's why you die. Some of you smile, I'll smile back. <laughs> I can already read your thoughts. Where is that heretic taking us this morning? Well, <laughs> it just shows on some of your faces. Bless your heart, you have so long been taught to believe in sickness and death. If anyone comes along and tries to encourage you to believe the plain teaching of the Word of God, some of you, you have, you, why you, you can't even enjoy the message. You're trying to figure out uh, where he's off or where he's missing it. Just give God a chance this morning. Amen. I'll tell you, dear friends, it's going to happen whether any of you out there believe it or not. Because I'm one who's confessing that I'm going to be a part in that group that the Bible in two passages at least says will not taste death. When certain things are fulfilled, the scriptures say, then there will be a group that won't have to die. It says, why you've quoted, as I've said, you've heard it quoted all your life in Sunday school. So every one of you out there believes Christians will not have to die. That is it in the sense that, uh, you know, the resurrection and that uh, you will have eternal life. You believe Jesus abolished death for you. And yet every one of you, almost without exception, believe ipso facto, you're going to die. But the scriptures say there will be a group that will not have to die. Uh, let me ask you a question. As I said, you have to listen with your heart, not your head. Why do men die? Well, Romans 5.12 tells you why you die and why most of you are confessing it. <laughs> Romans 5.12, Wherefore, by, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by that sin, and so death passed upon all men for all of sin. Why do men die? Because of sin? Well, are you still living a life of sin? Hebrews 9.26 says Jesus put away all sin for us. I've got news for you. He tells us in 2 Timothy 1.10, he has abolished death for the Christian. Now what's abolish mean? You don't need a dictionary definition of abolish. To abolish death, 2 Timothy 1.10, I'm giving you the word this morning, friends. I'm just going to get you up in a corner 
and then let you choose which way you're going. You're going to start confessing, I'm going to be an overcomer, or I'm going to go, I'm going to go the way most Christians go, have been going all their lives, and properly so, because scripture, scriptures say that you had to wait for a certain time to get this message. Amen. That's right. God has a fullness of time. Hallelujah. You see. But the point is, you are living in the last day when you can start confessing either one or the other. I want to tell you, dear friends, I'm not confessing what the church is confessing, that death is the doorway into the kingdom. Jesus says, I'm the door. I'm going to go that way. That's my confession. Hallelujah. Death's not the doorway into the kingdom. That's what the world confesses. That shouldn't be yours. Only sinners have to die, Romans 5.12. I'm saying has to die. We're dealing with principles now, not with the reality of the fact that, that most men have died. Only sinners have to die. Jesus could not have died. He could not have gotten sick and died. It was utterly impossible. Why did he die? 2 Corinthians 5.21 He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. John 10 I laid down my life. Listen to what he says. No man can take it from me. He says I lay it down. He put himself on the cross. That was his will. The cross was in his heart when he was born. He put himself there. He couldn't die. Sinless death, sickness and death are the result of sin. And Jesus could not have died. Sin is the cause of death. Death results from sin. Listen to what Jesus says in John 8, 51. If a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Now don't spiritualize it. Just listen to John eleven twenty six, where he says it again. Whosoever liveth, and believeth in me shall never die. You say, oh, that's just spiritual death. Well, what's the first thing you think of when you hear the word death? You think of spiritual death? What, do, what is it in Hebrews 2 that men feared until Jesus delivered them from? Physical death. Oh, yes, it includes spiritual death, but the first thing you think about when death is mentioned in Scripture or anywhere else is physical death. 1 Corinthians 15, 21, Paul said, In Adam all die. Well, what's the whole subject of chapter 15? The death and resurrection of the body, physical death. Romans 5, 12, uh, death is the cause, sin is the cause of death. Well, man is already dead spiritually. So the death he's speaking of there, again, is physical death. And just like in Romans 5, 1 Corinthians 15, and Hebrews 2, the first thought in your mind when we're talking about death is the death of your body. And so when we speak of death, that's what we're thinking about. All right, if Christians don't have to die, if death, if sin causes death, if Jesus has tasted death for all of us, if he says, 2 Timothy 1.10, that he's tasted death for all of us, or rather abolished death for all of us, that means to do away with it, then why is it that all men die? Believers and non-believers alike. Well, I've got some news for you this morning, friends. All men have not died. Amen. Hallelujah. That's the first thing. And if one hasn't died, there's a possibility there could be one more that wouldn't be. You're going to confess you could be that one? I've got a passage in Scripture that says a man confessed he wouldn't die. That's why he did it. Oh, I'll tell you. The meat's too strong for the babies, but we didn't remodel this barn for babies. Hallelujah. <laughs> Why there have been more there has been more than one in scripture that did not die. Yeah. Hallelujah. Now, we'll deal with that in a moment, but I want to say that most have. Believers and non believers alike. Then why do we die as Christians? And I say we, speaking of the church, not me, but we. I'm just going to be bold this morning. I'm just not going to get the pronouns and the verbs and adjectives mixed up. I'm not getting myself in a confession that I'm going to be outside that group that I'm going to show you about in a few moments. Amen. But why do all die? Why do Christians die as well as non-Christians? Because, Paul says in Romans 8, all creation is participating in the bondage of corruption and death. You see, legally, 
You've been delivered from death, but you've never, the church has never yet experienced what they've been delivered from. Why? Because God is not ready and could not give you a full redemption, an experience of a full redemption with a world still uh, participating in the bondage of corruption and death. You see, it'd be, it'd be a contradiction to have you running around here with a full redemption that is a body which could not die living in a world that decays and dies. And so this is what Paul is getting at in Romans 8 when he says all creation is waiting to participate in your redemption. Because when God manifests the redemption of the matured sons of God, I didn't say the whole church. The whole church will get resurrected. But when he manifests the full redemption of the overcomers, the matured sons of God, then creation itself is going to participate in that redemption. And they're going to walk around in an earth that has been restored and changed. This is what all of Scripture teaches. And so this is the reason why most people die and have died is because even believers could not have a full redemption manifested until God is ready to manifest the full redemption of his creation itself. But... All men have not died. If you turn over to 2 Kings, I want to show you that Elijah, Elijah didn't die, and he knew he wouldn't die and confessed he wouldn't. He knew it ahead of time. 2 Kings in chapter 2. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Now how in the world did Elijah know he's going to be taken up in a whirlwind? He's already telling Elisha. Now, we're not going to read the whole second chapter, but, the, but most of the second chapter deals with the fact that Elijah and Elisha both knew that he was going to be taken up in a whirlwind and not have to die. And Elijah said to Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and if thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And they went from there to Gilgal. They went to many places. That day, and Elijah would, Elijah would say, wait here for me. And Elijah would say, I'm not going to leave you because he knew he was going to be caught up and he wanted to be there when it happened. <laughs> and this just goes on and on. And so verse 3, and the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and they said unto him, even they knew it. He, they said, knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? See, even they knew it. He said, yea, I know it. Hold your peace. And Elijah said unto him, <coughs> Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Jericho. <laughs> Sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? He answered, Yea, I know it. Hold your peace. <laughs> Everybody knew it. I'm saying, friends, that here's a man who didn't die and it looks like half of the country knew it. And people get all shaky when you say that, uh, you know, that, there's, that the Bible promises there will be a whole group of people at the end of the age that will know it ahead of time. They may not know the day or the hour. Jesus says no one knows the day or the hour, but they'll know it's going to happen. And Elijah said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And the two went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off. And they stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smoked the waters. And they were divided hither and thither so that the two went over on dry ground. And it came to pass when they were gone over, now look at this, that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away for thee, from thee. You see, he conf he's confessing that he knows that he's to be caught away. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let me have a double portion of your spirit. Well, the whole chapter goes on. Most of the chapter goes on that way. That here is a man who didn't die. Here is the prototype, the principle, the possibility set forth. If you'll turn over now to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11 and verse 5, I want to show you another man who didn't die. One would be enough to make it possible. But here are two. And notice how this one escaped death. Hebrews 11 and verse 5. By faith... Hmm. Let's go back and read that again. By, by faith, Enoch was translated. Amen. 
Now you, if you've ever been here, you've heard of the 11th chapter of Hebrews. And every verse practically starts by faith. They got something from God or something happened. By faith, Sarah conceived a son. By faith, Moses forsook Egypt. By faith, by faith. And the same implication is here. You can't change the implication at all in verse 5. That by faith, Enoch was translated. That he should not see death and was not found because God translated him. Genesis chapter 5 tells you why. Because he walked with God. And while they were living 700 years and 800 years and 900 years old, Enoch was only 365 years old, a relatively babe in those days. And it says he walked with God and he was not because God took him. Hallelujah. And Hebrews, the New Testament, which gives us the full revelations, tell, t revelation, tells us how are the basis by which he was translated, and it's by faith. He would have not gone up except by faith. He believed it. Oh, praise God, he was confessing it. You can't have faith for something that just happens in your sleep or unexpectedly. God had told him, if you'll walk with me and obey me, you'll not have to taste of death. You're going to be a type of those in the end time that will be caught up and changed just like you. Elijah and Enoch in heaven without ever having to go through the grave to get there, the decay of the body or corruption. Why do you suppose God would translate these men except to encourage us to believe that when he sends his servants in this end time with the end time message and revelation that there will be a group of people who will believe his word. You have a full redemption. Galatians 3.13 tells you that you've been delivered from the curse of the law for Christ has been made a curse for us. That's a full redemption. He's been made a curse for us. We've been delivered from the curse of the law. What's the curse of the law? Sickness, poverty, adversity, death. Now I recognize, dear friends, that up until the end of the age, all God is promising, I don't like to say all because it's a big thing, what he's promising when he delivers his people from the curse is longevity. Psalm 91, 16, with long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now I'll tell you, you see the Old Testament saints, they lived a long time and we've got people today who walk in obedience who live a long time. You see sickness and disease, uh, these are just forms of death. And when you can uh, walk in obedience and walk in faith, then sickness and disease is not going to cause you to have to go to meet God prematurely. So he promises longevity. But the curse delivers not just from a premature death, but from death itself. And so there will be something given to a group at the end of the age which goes beyond Psalm 91, 16 and these other passages well, like Exodus 23, 25, where we are promised not just healing, but health. He said, if you will obey me, he said, I'll take all sickness away from the midst of you. He said, nothing will cast its young. I'll bless your bread and water and take all sickness out of the midst of you and put none of those diseases on you which were put on the Egyptians. Oh, you say, that's an Old Testament promise. Well, all the promises that you're standing on this morning are Old Testament. This is one revelation, friends, in this book. It's not an old and new in the sense that the old is done away with. But all that you have, your redemption, Isaiah 53, that's Old Testament. Your healing, Psalm 103 in Isaiah 53, that's Old Testament. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, Joel 2, that's Old Testament. Speaking in tongues, Isaiah 28, that's Old Testament. Anything you've got this morning is promise predicted and based upon Old Testament prophecies and promises that Jesus fulfilled in his death at Calvary. So don't get caught up in that, <clears throat> that uh, tunnel of confusion that is so rampant in our churches and seminaries today that this is old and therefore it's not for today. All that you have is based upon Old Testament revelation. But praise God, it's in the new. Galatians 3.13, you've been delivered from the curse of the law. Third John 2, you can have the same health as Exodus 23.25 promised. He said, I'll take sickness out of the midst of you. Third John 2 says, I wish that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Oh yes, it's the New Testament. 
And so if that's just the shadow, and look what the shadow was, Methuselah, 969 years. Adam, Adam lived 930 years after he sinned. Moses, 120 in his eye, was not dim, neither his natural strength abated. Those are the shadows of better things to come. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. It's all there. You say, well, then why do Christians still get sick and why do they still die? Because the same thing that caused sickness and death and adversity and all these other things in the Old Testament still cause it in the New. You know what caused all these things in the Old Testament? Disobedience. Unbelief. It's hard to find charismatics who believe in a full redemption, who believe God wants them to be healthy and prosperous, even spirit-filled Christians. So their unbelief about, their lack of faith about all of these precious promises is why they're participating in some of the curse of the law. As long as you're confessing the curse, uh, the fact that Jesus delivered you from it doesn't make it work automatically, dear friends. You've got to confess what you want to possess. He said, whosoever shall say to this mountain, you've got to speak faith to it. What things soever you desire when you pray. All things you ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. He didn't say you receive all things, but you'll receive all things you believe as you pray. And so the responsibility is on us. And so it's disobedience. It's a lack of faith. It's a failure to know and meet conditions. This is why Christians still participate in the curse, because they're perishing for a lack of knowledge or a lack of obedience. And so we have to be brought back into the place where the teaching ministry is restored to the body of Christ and people learn that there is no substitute for the Word of God, that while all the praise and the worship and the prophecy and the shouting and the jumping and uh, all of that is a great joy and has its place and the other would be pretty dry and dead without it. Yet you'll never grow on a miracle. You'll never grow on somebody else getting healed. You'll never grow and mature on praise and worship. These are, these, are just, these are just as necessary. We're not minimizing them. But we're saying that a man grows on the milk of the word. You grow on the anointed teaching. And so God is setting us back in the church. You see, because Christians still get sick or still have needs, Poverty and otherwise afflicting them uh, does not mean that Jesus didn't provide a full redemption. It just means that Christians are not participating in what Jesus has provided. It's just as simple as that. Except in the case of trial, like in the case of Job. I'm going to make this very plain to you. Except in the case of a trial, and we do have those. We preach on that all the time. And their purpose, we know that, to mature us. But except... It being a trial, if you don't have a full redemption, if you're not walking in health and prosperity, it's simply because you're not claiming and appropriating your full redemption. That's right. Because it's there. Amen. It's just as simple as that. In Colossians 2 and chap uh, chap chapter 2 and verse 10, Paul says, Ye are complete in him. Now if we're complete in him, then we have no other need. We have need of nothing. Amen. And if we're not living or appropriating a full redemption, it's just because we're not believing it or not meeting the conditions to have it. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 and 21 that in Adam all die. But he calls Christ the last Adam. Now we are all in Adam by virtue of our human nature. We can't help that. And when Adam fell into sin, he lost everything. In Adam, you lost your life, so you participate in death. In Adam, you lost your health, so you have sickness. In Adam, you lost your prosperity, so you have poverty. In Adam, you lost your peace and contentment, so you have worry and fear and anxiety. In Adam, you lost everything that is possible for, for God to give us. But since Christ is the last Adam and has redeemed the universe and we are joint heirs with him, then he's provided us restored to us all the things the first Adam lost. Amen. It's just as simple as that, that since he's the last Adam, he's made provision for us to receive all the first Adam lost. And it's up to our faith. It's up to us whether or not we're willing to receive it. What did the first Adam have that, that we have restored and most do not have? first Adam was sinless. 
Oh, you won't read long in the New Testament that he says for you to be perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. The first Adam was sinless. The first Adam was sickless. The first Adam was deathless. The first Adam had absolute prosperity. He had complete dominion. He was king over the earth. He was small g God of this world because when Satan usurped the world from Adam, then he is called God of this world now in Scripture. Why, in the Scriptures, Jesus said, God calls you gods, small g. You are. You're sons of God. God says you're gods. He said of the leaders of Israel, I've called you gods. Said to the Pharisees, if God calls you God, then why do you say I blaspheme when I say I'm the son of God? Adam lost all that. And this is being restored to us. Sinlessness, sickness, uh, sicklessness, deathlessness. Since Christ promises in Acts 3.21 that he's going to restore all things before he returns. Acts 3.21, I'll restore all things. Since Exodus 23, 25, and 26 says, I'll take all sickness out of the midst of you. Since 3 John 2 says you're going to have prosperity and health even as you're prospering spiritually. Since 1 Corinthians 3, 21 and 22 says all things are yours, including this present life, including this world, Amen. then if I rise up in faith and possess it, I can begin to enter into the full redemption right now. If I don't rise up in faith and take it, it does, it's not going to change the fact that it's promised me in the scriptures. It's as plain as the nose on your face that it's promised. If you don't rise up and take it, it's because... You do not believe the word of God because he says all things are yours, 1 Corinthians 3. He says in 2 Corinthians 1.20, I've already said yes to my thousands of promises. I've already said amen to my yes. He says it's up to you. You see, we've been taught to believe in imperfection and sickness and death and poverty and adversity. We've been taught that sickness is used by God to purify us and make us better. We've been taught that sickness sometimes is used of God to win the lost, you know, that if we get real bad sick or even die, that's even better than you may, <clears throat> than a loved one may get convicted and uh, so emotionally moved that they'll get saved. Well, if you believe that, friends, then you don't believe in a full redemption because Jesus Christ doesn't need your sufferings and death to win the lost, even in your family. Amen. All he needs is the word of God and your proclamation of it. Oh, I'm not saying that sometimes uh, people have not been saved because somebody got cancer or a loved one died, but they didn't get saved as a result of that. They got saved by believing the Word. Amen. But from God's side, He doesn't need you to suffer with Christ to get somebody saved. That's this dead church's teaching. He doesn't need you to die. Jesus already died. He's provided a full redemption. The Bible says you don't have to be sick, that you don't have to be poor that you don't have to be oppressed. That's what the Bible says. Amen. Then if Jesus has delivered me from sickness, if he's delivered me from death and the, has abolished death for all men, then, dear friends, it follows from that, that there is the possibility that we don't have to die. Amen. We've already set forth the fact that all men, it's given unto man once to die, and after that to judgment. That all men with few exceptions have died. We're not, we're not minimizing that. But the Bible goes on to say that in the end time there will be those who will move into the fullness of the Spirit and become mature sons of God and will be manifested as matured sons of God, not resurrected, but changed and brought into a glorious place of, of matured and manifested sons of God. And now... <clears throat> Over in Isaiah, I just want to give you a few scriptures here in closing to show you that it was prophesied what we're talking about, that there'd be a time when death would be abolished in Isaiah 25, verses 7 and 8. Now this is way back in the Old Testament, and look how clearly God predicted one day that he would... He's not talking about resurrection here. He's talking about abolishing death. Resurrection is, of course, the gospel. But we're talking about your resurrection, resurrected from death. 
verses 7 and 8. And he will destroy in this mountain, God will destroy the face of the covering cast over all people. He's speaking of death here. And the veil, death, that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death in victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. Amen. Hallelujah. He's predicting it there in Isaiah. Then in John chapter 21, he shows the possibility that you wouldn't have to die as a believer. Now I'm saying that he prophesied in Isaiah he would do away with death one day. And in John 21, we have the possibility set forth by Jesus that a man would not have to die. This is the case of Peter and John here after the resurrection. And uh, he tells Peter in verse 18 that one day he's going to be bound and taken where he doesn't want to go. Uh, verse 19, this spake he, signifying of what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to Peter, follow me. Then Peter, turning about, verse 20, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, what is he? Uh, no, no, <laughs> I got ahead of myself. The disciple who said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? And Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? See, Jesus said to Peter, you'll have to die to glorify me. Well, he said, what about John? He's talking about John. He says, what about him? Now, look what Jesus said. If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? And then went this saying abroad among the brethren that this disciple should not die. Yet Jesus did not say unto him, he shall not die. But if I will that he tarry. You see, he could will it. He said he could. That wasn't what he was telling him. That's what the early church, uh, that actually went around. That uh, many people said John will never die. He did. He was the only one of the apostles that was, didn't die a martyr's death. But uh, Jesus said, it's possible. And then the prototype, we've seen the prophecy, the possibility, the prototype, Enoch and Elijah, they did not die. There are two men. If you had one that didn't die, then there is the possibility again. Now, how about the promise? All right, we come to what we've been talking about all day, 1 Thessalonians 4. If you don't have a Bible, listen, if you do, I want you to read what you've heard in Sunday school all your life as far as the reading of the passage. But now you'll put it all together, and you'll see that God is preparing a group at the end of this age who will not taste of death. This is uh, 1 Thessalonians and chapter 4. Verse 15, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain. Now why would he say remain? Because there's going to be a group who will remain when the resurrection occurs. For this we say by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not go before them which are asleep. That's what prevent means in King James. We which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. Now he says we. That means there's going to be more than one. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain, there it is, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. And if we had time, we'd go in to show you that they go up in the clouds and they are changed and sent back. They don't taste of death. That's the vision I related to you some time ago, the sister had of Romans 8 and the matured sons of God. She said the matured sons, the overcomers, were caught up. They never tasted death. And the saints who were resurrected and the overcomers who had died, they were waiting for us to be translated and changed. And the two groups became one in the clouds and we both came back as one group, the matured sons of God and were manifested to this, well, first of all, ministered to the dead and institutional church through tribulation and then were manifested to this groaning creation as the matured sons of God. So there you have it in 1 Thessalonians 4 and here you have it again in 1 Corinthians 15. 
1 Corinthians 15, that there will be a group of saints who will not die. Why the scriptures have been promising us this for 2,000 years. It's got to happen sometimes. All the signs point to the time of this day, this age. Verse 51 of 1 Corinthians 15. Listen closely. Behold, I show you a mystery. It is to most Christians. I show you a mystery. We shall not all die. There it is. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Well, hallelujah. I wouldn't try to add anything to what I've said except... This, that there's going to be a group of saints at the end of the age. Revelation 12, verse 5, calls it the man-child who did not die, but when he was born, when he came to maturity, that is, the man-child, the overcomers, he was caught up to the throne of God. There's going to be a group of overcomers at the end of the age that are going to walk in their full redemption. The Bible says it. Hallelujah. And Jesus said that you can have what you say. Oh, you've got to do what you say. You can't confess you're an overcomer and live in sin. You can't confess you're an overcomer and remain in doubt. You can't confess you're an overcomer and let some big trial defeat you and go back to the doctor, your pills, or the finance company, or the wisdom and intellect of man depend on that. You're an overcomer. It's all the way. It's saying with Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. An overcomer. Would you stand with me? Almost said rise with me. Hallelujah. (laughs) Amen. Well, I trust you will rise with me because by God's grace and my faith, I'm going to be in that group that will see Jesus come. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. saith the Lord, desire to bring my people out of the shadows into the glorious liberty of the light of their full redemption in Christ Jesus. For I saith God am not a man that can lie, neither the son of man that can repent. If I have spoken it, I'll do it. If I have said it, I'll make it good. And to him that believeth, saith God, all things are possible. Rise up in faith and walk in the fullness of your redemption. Begin now as a child to learn to walk. And then saith God, thou canst leap. Leap not only with joy but with faith and come into a realm of faith where my church today does not stand. But thou canst know that this is thy message to thy heart this day by the faith that thou dost have in the clear teaching of my word in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. Saith God, it is there for thee to believe and to receive. Rise up in faith and possess it, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise be the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God forbid that we should fail to receive all that he's provided for us. If we cannot handle full redemption, it's because 1 Thessalonians and 1 Corinthians 15 have no meaning to us because we still have one foot in the grave and are confessing the other's going to be there pretty soon. But God says that in the last days he'll pour out his spirit upon all flesh and certainly you know that's happening. He says, when the end has come, Israel will be restored to her land and get her holy city back. Certainly that's happened. Many other prophecies are in the process of fulfillment. He says, when you see all of that, look up your redemption. Your redemption that Paul speaks of in Romans 8, the redemption of the body. He says, draws nigh. Praise God. If Enoch can confess it and Elijah possess it, then what hindereth thee, saith the Lord.